Hello and welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John. This is episode 230. Reminder, this podcast is question and answer. So uh, people send in questions, I answer them. I try to go into a lot of depth on my answers as best I can, as appropriate. And I know a lot of people just want uh, yes or no answers. And I thought it'd be a funny thing sometimes just to come in and just do yes or no answers. You know, like Vin, yes. Uh, Bob, no. But uh, I like to go into depth. And one of the things that helps me is when you, gentle listener, send me questions. If you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Like I said, it's episode 230. So let's start off with our first question from Vin. And Vin asks about a piece of exercise equipment that has in different ways, kind of come and gone throughout my whole lifting career, but the quality is so much better now, it's it's a lot easier to use them. So Vin asks this, what is your opinion on var- variable resistance and high quality latex bands? It seems logical and joint saving. Without naming a particular product, it seems a safe and effective strength training choice. However, there have many, been many home gyms over the years using this idea that have come and gone if this was the best system, why haven't the pros used it? Well, okay, so let's separate first. We'll separate chains versus bands. Uh, I said it, it's funny you, you asked this because this morning in the gym, I was talking with TJ. He's my good friend from Louisiana, a great man. And we, were talking, we talked about chains. And I said, you know, if I could do it all over again, every press, every squat, and most of my deadlift variations – Chains don't always work great with deadlifts because the chain will pool underneath the, the the weight and it just gets a little sketchy. I mean, you can work around it and there's ways, but it's just hard. I would do every press, squat, and deadlift with chains my whole career. Um, and my thrower is using chains a lot more than ever now. Uh, yesterday, it was a hard workout with all chains. The nice thing about chains is I never have to say down slow, up fast down slow, up fast, because the chains or the bands force the athlete to do that because as they get, as the chain comes off the ground, it gets heavier. And of course, with the bands, as you stretch them, they get harder. So let me just say this. If you're putting them on barbells, I like chains better than bands. My The reason I like bands so much, and I have, I think, Boy, I don't know of a band I don't have. So I like mini bands a lot. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go through. So you put mini bands around your socks. And uh, really, all you have to do is just go for a walk, trying to push your heels as far apart as you can. I joke, uh, I have about a 400-meter uh, block here. And I always tell people the first time, okay, we're going to go around the block once. And you know, we get about, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 feet, you know, whatever. And I get these looks like, are you kidding me? Uh, they're a great exercise. I like the big heavy. I have those big heavy Dynamax bands. I pretty much think I got them from Perform Better. And I use those on the hip thrust. So mini bands for all kinds of hip work. Uh, as I, I think is wonderful for hip replacement work. Uh, t- you know, total hip replacements. Uh, probably there'd be value in any, anybody who's got knee issues too. There's something, there's something good about that strength. Um, yeah, my, my wheels feel better after I do those. I'm pumped, but I feel better. The Dynamac band, bands, my favorite thing to do with them is hip thrust. I, I have two kinds of hip thrust machines, um, both from Brett. And I have the real big one that Sorenex made. And I use bands on that because I like bands for hip thrust, not not barbells. It's a personal thing. Uh, and, and, and I like them a lot. Now, the smaller bands, you know, the, the kind of, they're not mini bands and they're not those massive hip thrust bands. Those can be great for all kinds of rehab. In fact, you can already see I'm doing this exercise as I'm starting to explain it. Uh, when I was young, we did a lot of pull aparts. Um, they're great. I also like, and I, I, is the bands that have handles on both ends. The, instead of being flat bands or tubular, uh, I use those for curls, tricep extensions. Uh, and this weird little clean and jerk, uh, clean and press, I'm sorry. You, you, you don't really clean it appropriately because it does, it does some weird things, but you get in this position and then you press and you get that great variable resistance. A light 
band can really be hard because when it gets to here, it's six feet long. And when it gets to here, it's maybe seven. And so that band is really stretching, putting a lot of pressure. Just standing in place with, you know, so I'm stepping on the black band that I have and I press it overhead and I just stand there um, with the weight pulling it down and that, you know, that weirdness of it. I think stre uh, stre uh, stre uh, strengthens that whole chain up and down. Um, the issue, of course, is it's they're not a one-stop option. You'll notice I also talked about chains. I know a lot of good lifters put bands on barbells. Uh, I put bands on kettlebells to do all kinds of fun things. Generally, though, I'd much rather just use chains when I'm with barbells. Um, and then I use the bands exactly the way I just told you. I think bands have great value. Even, I mean, I don't know what a mini band costs. I mean, a dollar or something like that. It's, it's nothing. Uh, I get the little package with all the colored ones and we go through those. They break. Um, and actually it's because of shoes. Uh, putting them on, uh, tends to cut them a little bit. But the mini band is a buck and I think you get great value out of it. The, the ones with the, um, the handles on it. I thought for a while I would be able to travel with it, but frankly, it's a little too big for my uses. Even when I wrap them up, they're still, I mean, it's, it's a fair size. I only travel with one bag when I travel and that's a, that's a, that's a whole pair of shoes, socks, and a bunch of other stuff. So I travel with the minivan and a glute loop. Um, and then I just do whatever I can do, you know, if at a hotel gym or at the gyms I'm teaching at. So yeah, I like them a lot. Um, you know, I could certainly, if, if you ever wanted more information, Vin, maybe I could even do a little tutorial about how I use them. But the, the hardest thing is that it's so obvious when you see it, you're like, oh, okay, I got it. But it, it, it's fun. Um, the mini band walk, you know, if you just want to ruin your day, I, it, it doesn't, it's, it's wonderful, but it really does some marvels for those that the top of the glutes, uh, and, if you have any kind of lower body issues, injuries, long-term injuries, uh, it does really seem to kind of <laughs> bathe the region in lactic acid or whatever. And it, and it makes you feel good uh, once you take them off and sit down. So, thank you. Good question, Vin, and I hope it helped. Got a question from Eric. Um, Eric asked this. I was curious if when you suggest running programs where you lift uh, about three days a week, if you suggest doing anything for cardio on off days other than walk. I already walk a ton, so that's a given for me, but curious if I could do like cycling or yoga or very light accessory days on my off days. Any insight you might uh, would be helpful. And then uh, his approach to off days when running programs like, it's interesting, okay, so he says running on the top, uh, and I thought instantly running programs, and now he's talking about He's doing programs where you lift three days a week. So if you're doing something like Mass Made Simple, I'm real clear in, um, I'm real clear in the book. Uh, you do the workout. The next day you don't do anything. And if you actually do the squat workouts, you might not even get, be able to get out of bed, as I've heard. And on the, so workout day one, complete recovery day two. Day three is a tonic day. You kind of go back in, maybe some goblet squats, some easy stuff just to get yourself prepped. And then day four would be the workout. And you repeat that for six straight weeks. Um, what do you do in your off days? Uh, I remember when I first heard about training three days a week from Jim Schmitz, the great Olympic lifting coach here in the United States and my coach on the sports palace. Now I trained with Dick at the Pacifica Barbell Club. But, you know, I remember talking to Jim, especially when I got a little bit older, Jim was real clear. He goes, you know, you, you know, you, you can't train five days a week for three hours the rest of your life. And then his idea was you would train three days a week, you know, like a Monday, a Wednesday and a Saturday. And you would go in and give it your all. And the other four days a week, and I'll quote him, go bowling, learn to play chess, get a life. <laughs> is what he told me. Uh, I, I learned to play chess. Uh, I never did get that life thing, but off days, it depends on what you're doing. Now, if you're doing a hard Olympic lifting program, the off days are going to be off days. If you're doing like a, a serious power lifting program, the off days will be the off days. If you study Charlie Francis's work, the great Canadian sprint coach, or even if you look at my uh, uh, movement matrix, 
certain exercises lend themselves to kind of longer recoveries. Uh, uh, Charlie included uh, high-end sprinting. Of course, we're not talking about 17 second, you know, 100 meters. We're talking about someone coming in at 9.9. Uh, that took a while to recover from. I know my own personal example, deadlifts take a while for me to recover from. Clean and jerks take me for a while to recover from. And uh, so it'd be high intense sprints. Deadlifts, clean and jerks are the hardest things for most people to recover from. All right. If you're doing that kind of thing, you're off days, you're, your nervous system, your, your whole, I mean, your whole every system in your body needs the day off. Now, when you read Charlie's work, you get a sense of why you can bodybuild seven days a week, two and three sessions a day, because the like the neurological hit of doing concentration curls, you know, isn't the same hit you get from a 400 pound clean and jerk. And, uh, you know, you do a 400 pound clean and jerk, uh, you know, and if someone says in two hours, OK, let's do that again. I mean, there are people who can do it. I certainly couldn't. But if I was doing concentration curls and curls and, you know, tricep work uh, at breakfast, a couple hours later, we could probably get back in the gym and do, you know, lats and, you know, a chest day and a back days I hear all the time. And probably that night, I could probably come in and do calf raises and forearm curls. Yeah. But so that's that's the key. So much of, so much of it, uh, Eric, is based on what the lifts you're doing and, the, and how hard you're going at them. Um, at the workout generate Dan John University, I have people tell me, yeah, I pick five days a week. And then three of the lifting days, they're lifting days. You know, it's three sets of eight, push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry. I'm just making it up. Okay. On the other two days, they pick, they, you go in and you select the exercises and they pick some fun things to either practice on or things that make them work on their flexibility or mobility. Um, I always found that, you know, coming into the gym and there's certain exercises like, uh, I would say overhead squats, straight leg deadlifts, uh, dips for sure, some variations of the side bend. And for me, chin-ups seem to help with my uh, mobility and flexibility. So I could come in, if I'm lifting weights hard three days a week, I might be able to come in on a Tuesday and just do those exercises and just kind of get out of the gym, you know, kind of, it's one of those move good, feel good workouts. So it's a good question. Um, when you're working on any quality, always remember that as you get closer and closer to your personal top end, you're gonna to have to have more and more recovery. So, you know, when I was first clean and jerking and snatching and I was snatching in the low 200s and clean and jerking in the mid 300s, you know, I could probably have a day off, come back and do it again. When I got a lot stronger than that, I could have, I would have a big workout on a Saturday with Dave Turner at the Upper Limit Gym. And then the following Saturday, that would be the day I went hard again on the snatch and clean and jerk. Um, because I just couldn't recover from those numbers. Later, of course, and I've told this before, um, you know, it, I would only go heavy on a meet day with officials and a crowd and uniforms and weigh-ins. So a lot of it's going to depend on the intensity that you do. If you're doing a standard hypertrophy uh, workout, three days a week, go for the walks on the other days, take care of your protein needs, take care of your sleep needs, and you should just be fine. Okay, Eric? Thank you. A marvelous question. Okay. Okay. We got a guy named Brian here, and his name is, and he says, my name is Brian Pitzer. I'm a head football coach in Ohio. In Ohio. That's awesome, man. I, those are Those are tough jobs. We have used your easy strength model since July with our team and used it during our in-season workouts three to four times a week. We noticed that a lot of solid strength gains from our athletes. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Isn't that something? In in season, getting stronger. And I think if you really do want to be ready for the playoffs, if you really do want to uh, you know, be ready for the championship games at the end, you, you got to keep kind of improving certain qualities. Obviously on things like offense, defense, special teams, you'll add this, you'll add that, you'll add this. But very often on the physical front, we are just limping in to those last games. All those minor injuries, uh, we used to call it the Goomba, this flu that shows up every season. But if you're being smart in the weight room and getting stronger, I don't know, I think you can overcome some of that anyway. 
Uh, now the season just finished and we're looking for uh, at implementing Mass Made Simple twice a week during the coming off season. Okay, and that's exactly what we did. Um, I would circle uh, the way we had it here in Utah, the, the football uh, playoffs and around, around Thanksgiving. So you would give a, a week or two off just before Christmas, which ten, ends up being, what, four or five weeks. And then we would do Mass Made Simple in either January, February, or late January, February, first week or so of March. And using easy strength in between, how would you program a high school football program who uses a Monday through Thursday approach with Mass Made Simple? Uh, well, there's two things in Mass Made Simple that I learned from coaching high school kids. First, the complexes and the high rep squats. Uh, the issue with the high rep squats is, of course, the uh, can you can a kid take the five minutes it might take to do those 50 reps? So what I would recommend um, is since you're doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you might have to split up the groups on who squats. So there's two squat workouts a week. So you want to have a, a Monday, Wednesday group and then a Tuesday, Thursday group. I would say in the warm up section, everybody should do complexes. The complexes are, are a given. The complexes really help the high school football player. If any of you are looking for anybody, anybody listening, looking for increases in lean body mass in a very interesting way, uh, complexes with barbells, it is fascinating. It just It's just fascinating how it'll just develop uh, lean body mass. Now, the downside is they're very exhausting and you have to really push it. So the group that's doing the Monday, Wednesday, for example, maybe on Tuesday, Thursday, they can get the one arm presses in the military, uh, the military, the one arm military presses, the bench press, the bat wings and anything extra and a, a kind of an active movement day. Uh, so Monday, Wednesday, they would complex and squat Tuesday, Thursday, they do all the other stuff that it'd be kind of actually a nice, nice day because have everyone training. The Tuesday, Thursday group, you just switch it. Uh, they would squat and complex on Tuesday and Thursday, and they would uh, do the other stuff Monday, Wednesday. Um, it's a good idea. It's a good program, and it does really seem to help high school boys uh, thrive. Uh, I like what you got here. Could, could you keep doing this for a while, that idea of Mass Made Simple? The answer is no. And a reminder, after Mass Made Simple for high school football players, uh, spend a week or two, maybe the first week after, uh, working on the basics of sprint technique, uh, working on looking better, looking prettier as you sprint. And then uh, the next week, maybe you can actually add some speed to that, maybe even some agility work. Because if a, if a adolescent boy puts on, you know, they put on 15 pounds. I've had even more than that, but it somewhere around 14 to 20 pounds is more than norm for high school kids. When they go out to sprint, they're trans, they're different, and they have to actually you have, so you have to spend a little bit of time practicing uh, movement again and take your time on it. So you know, six weeks of mass made simple, two weeks of sprints, and then see and then sit back, fold your arms, assess, and go from there. Uh, great question. And I'm just, congratulations to you for doing that. Yeah. So we got a question from Chris. Um, he says, I'm a 33-year-old father of a four-year-old with a baby on, on the way in March. Congratulations. And this spring, I started putting some real effort into gaining functional strength to keep me healthy for my family. And salute to you. That is, that's just awesome. Okay. I got into kettlebells and I've been doing the Simple and Sister, okay, well, uh, another program, with snatches, clean and press, and thrown in for variety. I like the idea of always being strong enough to lift my daughter, at least till she's out of grade school. Uh, that's something I do every every year. I pick up and uh, both of my daughters. Um, the, the, the phrase I use is that you always know the first time you pick up your child. You never know the last time. So I picked up Kelly and Lindsay on Thanksgiving. So, you know, that's the last time I picked up my daughters. Uh, they're a little bit older than yours. Um and get up, and I set him sides to be able to do a whole bunch of stuff with the 40 kilo bell when I'm 40 years old. I like that. I'm six foot four, 205 and fairly lean. Right now I'm doing all those exercises for sets of 10, uh, fives for the Turkish get up, fairly easily with the 40 K, the 40, pardon me, 40 pound kettlebell. And I'm looking to upgrade and convert to metric to a 24 uh, soon. Now, finally, the question, 
Do you think a goal of the 40K for each of those movements is reasonable for a healthy 40-year-old doing, especially given my size and timeline? Oh, absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> you gave yourself seven years. Hell, I'd give you seven weeks. Yeah. Uh, no, I think it's a good idea. So there's nothing special about the 40 kilo bell, but I, it's one of my favorites. And the reason I like it so much, it's like I like the 20 so much. It's just such a natural number to me from my Olympic lifting background. And I'm sure the bulk of the listeners too. I'm sure some of you who don't know the kettlebell world are going like, Wait, a 22 kilo bell? He needs a 36? What's going on here? So the 40 is a real natural number, and I and I think it's it's a good number. Uh, for my Americans, it's 88 pounds. Doing a Turkish getup with 88 pounds is very reasonable. Doing snatches with the 88, uh, 40 kilo is very reasonable and doable. Uh, pressing it uh, should be something uh, I I would expect the the bulk of the males I know to be able to do that. And again, you know, it depends on the audience. It depends on the person. But yeah, I think you have plenty of time to do it. Um, I would make sure that, uh, especially now that you're moving into the kilo world, you are going to find that uh, moving up just to the 24 kilo from the 40 pounds. So uh, it's it's 13 pounds heavier and it'll slow you down a little bit at first. But remember, with the 24 you have all the tools you need to get your strength and conditioning goals. Yes, it's better to have, like I have, I have three Olympic bars, 35 this and thousand of that and a million of these. And it, it's easier when you have all that stuff. But if we locked you in a room for a year with a 24 kilo bell and you said, hey man, I'm gonna come out better on the other side, you would come out better on the other side. So take your time before you buy the bell and really, spend time exploring everything you can do and chase all kinds of things with that 24 kilo. I'll be doing a cert here in a couple of weeks. And I mean, I would expect you to be able to snatch that 24 a hundred times. So just kind of, you know, think about that. And I would expect to be able to press that 24 with both hands. I mean, I think that, I think it's, we're supposed to do it for five, but I mean, I insist on you know getting a lot higher than that. I hope it helps. Thank you for your question. Jeff asks a really interesting question. In the spring, I will be selling my house and downsizing to, most likely, a studio apartment for a year or so. By selling my house and moving 35 miles away, I will be losing both of my home gyms. I have a small garage that I use for kettlebells, jump rope, burpees, and a few other movements I can do in that small space. I also have the majority of my weights and equipment in a friend's machine shed. This includes two squat racks, about 600 pounds of plates. This is good. Uh, some really good uh, dumbbells, plyo boxes. He's got a Echo bike, a Concept 2 rower, a skier, a ski erg, huh? and a bike. Wow, <laughs> that's a good home gym. Two really good setups. I want to avoid a gym for as long as I can at the new place. And I was wondering if you would recommend uh, for a very small space. My initial thought would be to bring the Concept 2 bike and some kettlebells. I would be willing to buy a few more than the two. He's got two 30-pounders and two 40-pounder kettlebells I have. What types of movements would you recommend in such a small space? And how would you uh, switch it up to avoid boredom and repetitiveness? Any insights will be great. Well, it's interesting because the one thing I would buy, because I, okay, so this hap this happened to me uh, when I was living here in Utah for a long time. And uh, we moved out to Burlingame and I went from having, you know, my gym had you know, all kinds of chains and an incline bench and, you know, all kinds of good stuff, great Olympic bars. And then I moved into a, an apartment in Burlingame, California. And all I really had, I had a TRX, a, a suspension trainer, and I had a, a I had a, a single kettlebell, my 28 uh, kilo. I, I liked it a lot. Uh, I was going through some, you know, just some general physical issues at the time that were easy to work out. And but it was kind of exciting just to just have those two pieces of equipment. So all my pulling and my mobility and a lot of my push-ups were done with the suspension trainer. And then uh, I did a whole bunch of classic, traditional, the big six of the RKC, the swing, the get up, the snatch, the clean, the press, and the, and, uh, the squat, which I almost forgot. Uh, which is funny because it's the goblet squat. Um, yeah, I, you can do everything 
when you mention the concept too, now that would just be something if you if you like the if you like rowing or whatever one you like, I would take the one you like the most. Downside of a concept two, it's massive. Okay, it's a big it's a big engine. Now, I always folded mine up and it sits into a, you know into a space, but it's still big. And you know, just if you're going to be in a, did you say a uh, studio apartment? Yeah, that thing is always going to be in sight. So, you know, if you bring over uh, uh, a friend, uh, you know, there's your Concept 2 rower right there. Nice thing about that kettlebell and the suspension trainer, you can always kind of put them away. You can put them inside of a closet. You can put them under a bed. That's just that's just a thing for me. It's It's not a big deal. One thing that I really got smarter at, and I think it really helped me with easy strength, uh, especially writing the this last book, the Omni book, is by only having a 28 and being on a, a situation where I really couldn't lose a bell, it taught me to, I would I would push myself to a reasonable rep range. Um, if, you know, if I'm doing the 28, and by the way, the 28, I, you know, if I'm doing, you know, it, I'm much stronger than a 28, so I could do it weight or press, I could do the bottoms up press, so if I'm on the balcony or your, your living room doing presses, I get to say like we're going five, six, and then seven starts to go, uh, bring it down, put it to the ground and come back and fight another day. Come back and, you know, take another set. So it's like the workout counts, uh, calls for 12s, okay, in the clean and press. And you only get like uh, seven before they get ugly, then it's seven and that's okay. Um, if you're training in a situation that you can't drop weights, that you, you're really tight on wiggle room, uh, this concept of, you know, perceived exertion is really good. I'm a big fan of it. Easy strength is based on it. I'd rather you, you know, chase, you know, reasonable reps for 40 days and then go for a max than, you know, fail, fail, miss, fail, fail, miss, you know, you know, your spotter deadlifted it off you, you know, cheat reps. I'd rather you do that because I think long term, uh, the body learns with success, not with multiple failures. That's my opinion, and I, I, I'm sticking to it. I, I so I would say, if you bring the kettlebells and then another piece of equipment, and just you know, kind of you know, it might be a good thing. You've also got that uh, the bike. You know, kind of fold your arms. You know, kind of go. Can I see myself rowing? You know, five days a week for the next year. Now, I can't see myself doing that. But with a bike, I could see myself doing it because I would put on a football game and 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 watch the game and bike. So I don't think I could watch a football game on a ski erg, though that would be a fun... Now, there, there. All you guys are looking for challenges. Watch an entire, uh, entire football game using the ski erg. But here's the thing. Uh, I get to question you about every situation and every penalty. And every play. Uh, I don't know if you could do it. That'd be hard to focus. Uh, good luck to you. Hey, would you let me know what you decide and uh, on the exercises? I think with the kettlebells, you've got the whole the whole buffet table is in front of you. Um, and it, this will give you a real good chance to work on your techniques and work on your skills. And remember, as you improve your skills, you're going to see improvements in body composition because you're going to get better and better. Thank you so much. I got another Eric question today. Well, I tell you, Eric's been busy today. On your recommendation, I've read The Healthy Golfer, a uh, Phil Maffetone book, and the principles are sound. However, it lacks exercise direction. Uh, now, you're going to say something I don't agree with. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say I do work with TPI, but several of the people I work with are TPI-ers. And I'm also, I'm also, I would say, good a friend of Greg Rose's. And I always sit up front at his presentations and he always, and I always, he and I always talk afterwards going, you know, we knew this. And, uh, one of the things that's interesting is that the vertical component of the big swing is so much more important than they thought. And they're, they're, they're proving it each and every day. Everyone wants to increase, increase their rotational stuff, but really it's, <laughs> you almost, <laughs> I wouldn't, I don't take my golf advice, but. You almost jump your swing. I said almost, and I put a lot of caveats, so don't. Um, the modern golf swing is aimed at producing maximum grounds force and trans 
transferring that stored rotary power into impact. It feels that this is also a principle behind throwing sports and Olympic lifting. Um, yeah, I mean, remember with Olympic lifting and throwing sports, the body is one piece and what you're trying to set up the your body for is the most efficient. Um, you want to put your levers in the best places you can put your levers. You want to stretch those muscles out to their max and then just become a kind of like I coach my athletes. I just want them to be a bag of rubber bands, you know. Um, easy strength is perfect for in-season golf training. Well, thank you. Good to hear that. But I live in the north. I have five to six months without golf and the time to dedicate to building strength and conditioning in, in this area. I know you advocate seasonal training and it seems like the right time. Wonder if I can make some good games in that time frame. Five or six months? Oh, yeah. You can make a lot of gains in strength in five or six months. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be... I wouldn't be too afraid of the deadlift and the squat family. And I would actually think that would be, in many cases, the safest alternative. Uh, you say in the North, so I'm guessing either Canada or the Northern United States, but it, it doesn't matter. But getting strong without breaking anything, I think is good. I was thinking about this. I, I read this question earlier and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. But honestly, I, this is going to sound strange to any golfer, but I, when I look at the sport, I often think that uh, Romanian deadlifts and overhead squats would be good good lifts for golfers. Now, the golfing community is now screaming at me, but I will say this in my defense. Um, in 1950, uh, at the Ohio State Championships, a guy clean and jerked 300 pounds. Well, uh, not long after, he won the Ohio State Golf Championship. And I think he went on to win the Open. And of course, uh, I was at a Sky Club in Atlanta one time, and a guy turned around and it was Gary Player. And Gary and I talked for a long time about lifting for golf. Um, he he I go, he turned around and I said, Hey, you're Gary Player. And he goes, Hey, you lift weights. And it was kind of funny because we just and uh, he told me about, you know, he was a he's a barbell guy. Of course, you know, he's he's older now, so he might be using machines, but in his youth, you know, it was just good old fashioned, you know, rusty barbells, clean and press, and you know, the 25 different exercises. You read in the magazine that month and the next month you did the Bosco workouts and the next, you know, how that used to be. But I do think easy strength would be a really good idea. And while you're doing the easy strength program, uh, my son-in-law Thomas has a indoor putting thing. I would really like it if your rest periods were putting. And, and I'm telling you why. Because if you just did a set of five in the deadlift, and not a big lift, I mean, in, in a whatever trap bar deadlift, you know, you're not, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you know, didn't blow any blood vessels in your eyes, and you're not screaming or anything. So uh, while you're still kind of, you know, a little bit of huffing and puffing, walk over and practice your like your your putt. I think that'd be really valuable. Uh, maybe you know five or six putts, and then go back to the go back to the barbell. A couple of putts, go back to the barbell. And then the other thing I'd recommend you can, as best you can, if you could just even set up a, just like set up a, this is my waste can, but set up a bucket somewhere in your facility, if you can, and uh, just try to chip into the bucket, you know, come up with some kind of little contest for yourself. And the re I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. As you're getting stronger and stronger, I want you to still uh, narrow into accuracy. Um this is, you know, one of the things I think we, we missed in a lot of sports when weightlifting first became popular is that, well, basketball and American baseball, you know, we have this weight room where we do all this stuff and now we go out on the court and we do this stuff. But, and so a lot of, I mean, a friend of mine in high school said he wouldn't lift weights because it hurt his touch in his shot. And I kept thinking, uh, you know, John, no, no offense, but you don't have any touch. Um, so it wasn't the weight room, but if, if you were in the weight room, and this of course comes from, uh, the classics of circuit training, uh, the German book I have somewhere, um, they would do, a uh, oh, medicine ball or weightlifting exercise followed by layups or free throws. And I think you have to do that with golf too. Um, so while you're at some small level of fatigue, take a few, if you can, chip shots, um, uh, if you can, and ideally you would, you'd work on that putter. 
but we're working on accuracy here, okay? And I think that'll help your distance as much as, you know, getting your squat up to 900, okay? Good, good fun question. Thank you. Got a question from Thomas. Thomas is 26, 188 uh, centimeters. So for my Americans, he's about 6'1 or so. 88 uh, kilos, so he's, you know, in the 190 range. I mostly do ABC workouts twice a week and the week after only once. Exactly how I recommend it. Thank you, Thomas. The other days of the week are often swings and a lot of press or easy strength when I'm in the gym. So I'm a big fan of the ABC program. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I will get comments sometimes when people ask me about the ABC program. I even got a comment when I did the single side armor building complex and I explained what the traditional ABC was and then someone still didn't know what the double bell variation was. Which So the armor building complex, two kettlebells, two cleans, one press, three front squats, weight down, two cleans, one press, three front squats, weight down. I think the ideal rest period is I go, you go, however long it takes your partner to go, you go, okay? Uh, I do it with 24 and 32 kettlebells, 32 kilo kettlebells, that's a good lift, as I haven't acquired a heavy enough pair yet. Uh, just, you know. Do you have a strength standard for the ABC? Are the loads I'm currently using sufficient to overcome life's physical challenges? I think if you can do the ABC with the 32s, the double 32s, let's just say, let's just pick up around half an hour. So you do 30 rounds of it, so 90 total squats. Now, if you're doing the 32s, folks, that's 64K. That's you know, it's 140 pounds-ish. For 90 squats, yeah, 90 squats with 140-ish is plenty. You'll, 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 you'll take care of business. You'll... Uh, the 32 is actually quite good. Um, as a lark, uh, I've done the 36 and the 40. And frankly, it's the 40 for me anyway. Uh, my double clean just suddenly just gets ugly. I, I need to really lock down for those. And it's just not, it's not a good lift. But I think the standard should be the 24. But the 32 may be your test one. Quick idea for you, Thomas. And this is something I want you to think about is on when you're doing it twice a week, use the 24s. When you're using one day a week, use the 32s. And try somehow to monitor and, and see if you can improve that those total numbers of 32s, okay? Great question. Uh, big fan of the ABC Armor Building Complex. And, and, and it makes me happy that so many people like to work out. So hats off to you, okay? I appreciate it. We got a question from a guy named John. That's a good name. And I like this. I'm a I'm 43-year-old man who is about 15 pounds or so from what my goal weight is, or should be, huh? I have a 30-pound weight vest and an area where I can do a very nice three-mile walk with a fairly steep hill for about a mile of it. My question is, is should I do that walk with a 30-pound vest? And how often you suggest if my if it's my goal to aid in my 15 pound weight loss and maintain strength and push the cardiovascular health. Well, you know, for body fat loss, there's a couple of things. Um, there's another set of tools called heavy hands. That's when you take two pound weights or three pound weights or five pound weights and, and you, but the thing is you really have to pump your arms. Um, I have made an interesting uh, in, in, insight in the last year is I have big, I have big weight vests. And I noticed that when I got the lightest one I have, I think I, it's 10 pounds, it's not very much. But when I was using the 60, I would come home from a ruck, a, a walk. And this three mile, that's gonna take you what, uh, probably 50 minutes, uh, three days a week. And with that 30 pound weight and a mile hill, um, I mean, I just can't see how all your dreams can't come true. Now, the reason I mentioned heavy hands is that to, to get exhausted, the heavy hands work best. The reason I mentioned the lighter vests is if you're going five or six days a week, you're going to have to have some variation. I know this, uh, John. The 30 pound is right there as probably historically the perfect load. Uh, it's basically the load the Roman uh, army used. They, they had 15 kilos. It was uh, so 30 to 33 pounds. 
One of the reasons I sometimes will push people to lighter vests is that if I wear a 10, you got the 30 and I got the 10. When we get done, I'm not freaking out trying to eat f carbs and food. I because I wore the 10 and I can kind of stay in that uh, non-crazy zone a little bit, you know, when you first do rucking sometimes. Uh, for those of you who've never done a, a three-mile ruck with uh, a 30-pound weight vest, uh, especially with the hill, it, it's a weird amount of work. Uh, it's cold this time of year, and, you know, we'll we'll come around the corner, and it, it can be in the teens here. So it's below freezing when we do our rucks. And I'll look over and I'll see the, the vest will be here. And I'll see the mass of sweat stains uh, from, from my athletes and the people who train with me. It is a lot harder than I think a lot of people think. I mean, so to summarize what I think, if you're going to use that 30, three days a week, I would say do that. Uh, the other days of the week, just if you just want to go for a stroll or a walk with no vest. If you, it is ad adjustable, maybe, maybe two days of the week, you do that real hard one. And the third day, just do the 10 and try to get a sense on a couple of things. What's your appetite like? Um, what's your sleep level like? And what is your general, you know, how am I doing for the rest of the day? Uh, I have, I have gone on some hikes, uh, this is a while ago, but there's a mountain here called Mount Olympus, which is tough. And it's straight up and then it's straight down. And it's a tough mountain. And I was helping these, it was a youth group for troubled, uh, for troubled teens. And the, the director said, hey, we're going to take all these kids up to Mount Olympus. And I thought, oh, you know, you don't just take a bunch of kids who have, you know, some issues and, you know, have them go on a six hour hike. So he loaded me up with all the like uh, emergency kit and the, the all the extra water, which was gallons. Uh, and so my load, of course, of course, it's great because it's water. So, you know, as the day went on, it got easier. But when I got home, man, I was, I, it was like a 12 hour nap. That obviously is good long term. You know, I mean, obviously that would be great to, you know, metabolize your fat. But at the same time, Sometimes when you go too hard on things, you get yourself on that scary side of, of recovery. And what I worry about when you're, you're going too hard on a fat loss program is that you set yourself up for failure down the line. So I would rather see you do three by 52, three walks a week with a nice ruck than uh, for 52 weeks, than one insane day and you don't ever do it again, okay? So always keep that in my mind. I, I like this idea. And I gotta tell you, I think 15 pounds is very doable. Uh, one thing I would do if I were you is I would really increase my intake of vegetables. Uh, I I make this little Greek salad, or, well, it's a Mediterranean salad with just, uh, with a variety of vegetables. And I try to eat that at every meal when I'm trying to, when I'm trying to cut. It satiates me. I don't use the feta cheese like usual. And that's only because um, <laughs> if you put feta in there, you really have to eat all of it right then. And so I just make a big batch and then uh, I, I just eat it slowly. Once you put the olive oil and the red wine vinegar in, uh, you, you, the countdown, you have to start eating it pretty soon. And if you put feta in there, you, you got to eat it with them. And, and so I just rather have, you know, just be able to eat anytime. I get plenty of protein. So think about that too. So make sure you got the nutritional side locked in. Make sure you got the sleep locked in. And make sure then finally get those veggies locked in. And then off you go. Get those walks in, okay? Great, great question. And, and uh, I would like you to let me know how it goes, okay? Thank you. Wow, well, that's it for today. Um, we, we had a real mix of questions today. I enjoyed that. It's kind of nice to see American football players using easy strength and people going for rucks. And it's, it's nice to hear all this. Listen, if you have questions, remember, you'll send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I love answering your questions. I'm here each and every week to do it for you. And until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.